favorite question has always been why? Why in my youth asking, is the sky blue? To my adult questions of why do I have to attend these meetings or have to follow these laws? To the podcast's inquiry into why some artists are successful while others are not. This desire to understand not just how to make art, but why to make art is part of what drove me to create this podcast in the first place. I want to question not only what we do and how the art world works, but why does it work this way? I've always learned more effectively from stories than facts. I think of myself as like 75% street smart, 25% book smart. If you tell me that a career in the arts has a slim to nil potential for success, I feel the need to test that hypothesis and see for myself. In my youth, I thrived on being able and willing to do things that I was told I could or should not be doing. I like to understand how things can be bent before they're broken, and this has led me to creating this podcast. Over the past three years of this podcast and 250 episodes, with time and reflection over the range of experiences that these various professionals have had throughout their careers, everyone's experiences and career paths were so varied and unique that I started thinking, how can I hear a side-by-side -side comparison of these experiences? And I realized that in 2021 was the 20th year since my graduation from my MFA program, and I thought I would contact all the people that I graduated with and see what their experiences in the arts world had been since graduation. Listening to their reflections on their reasons why they got their MFA and how that experience has impacted their lives and careers. Many of the people I graduated with I couldn't find. They either didn't uh, exist as far as I could tell through my research or they did not respond to my reaching out. Some could not talk because their companies uh, said no and others didn't feel comfortable talking on the record, which is totally legitimate and understandable. So out of the 46 people that I graduated with, I was able to get 11 people that were able and willing to discuss their lives. This is the first of a 10-part inquiry into the lives and experiences of 11 people who got the same Masters of Fine Arts, though in various disciplines, from the same institution, the San Francisco Art Institute, graduating in 2001. And 20 years of reflection of experiences post-graduation. I call this series retrospective, because that's what we all really want. In this episode, I wanted to know why they chose to pursue an MFA in the first place and why they chose San Francisco Art Institute in particular. You will hear conversations with my fellow graduates in this order, Ricardo Rivera, Sonia Heinrichsen, Amanda Marchand, Barbara Bartos, Mira Hecht, Joram Wahlberger, Lizea Lyons, Erez Golan, and Peter Wu. I knew that I wanted to pursue the arts, but I was pursuing it for the wrong reasons. I was pursuing it because I wanted to be part of that art world that I, or that myth of the art world that I imagined myself wanting to be part of. You know, um, it's one of the first times that I felt this ability uh, or desire to express myself was accepted. And to be surrounded by all these other people that had the same mindset was pretty amazing for me. So I started at Sacramento City College. And um, I remember my first experience in art. I was kicking back with my homeboys in the cafeteria. And one of my friends, Danny, said, come to this drawing class. And I'm like, fuck that. I don't want to take a drawing class. <laughs> you know? So I went and this professor, Lorraine Landau, was just like crazy over the drawings I was doing. And there were like traditional line contour drawings that I've never done before. And I was just listening to what she was saying, just doing what she was saying. And she wouldn't stop talking about how incredible my observations were. And I'm like, yeah, get away from me, lady, you're like too intense. 
she walked me over to the registrar's office and made sure that I signed up for a class. So that's how I got into art. I continued studying art at Sacramento City College and they had a San Francisco Art Institute Community College Transfer Award. So once I saw that, I'm like, oh, I, I had no idea what the Art Institute was. I was gonna go to, I was applying to UC Davis and just being happy being there, but that would have been too close to my family. So eventually I got that award and I went to the Art Institute as an undergrad and as a graduate student. I think that's kind of actually dates back to a long story. I was traveling the United States cross country. I think that must have been in 88 or something like that. So a long time ago, I was just finished with high school or maybe I was still in high school. I, I don't know, but I, it was, it was when I was like 19 or something. And, with my then boyfriend and we were traveling through the U S for like six weeks, two months or something. And that kind of gave me this amazing overview what the United States really is, all the different, you know, states and demographics and people. And it, it, it was really great for somebody from out of the U S to get that amazing view. And after that, somehow, I, I really did love California, you know, traveling through it and San Francisco. And this was before I became an art student, even in Germany. But so I think that idea kind of was, I would say, germinated in that trip that I thought, well, maybe, you know, when I'm a student, maybe I'm just going to go maybe I'm just going to try and do a, a broad semester or something like that. I applied to a few grad schools, but I chose the San Francisco Art Institute because I, after getting my degree in English literature in Canada, I went to Emily Carr College of Art and Design in Vancouver for a year and a half just to take some art courses. And they sent me down there on scholarship when I was like 23 to the San Francisco Art Institute. So I just studied there for a semester and I loved it. And then I wasn't sure I wanted to do a graduate program. I wanted to explore writing and art on my own and see, is this something that I'm just compelled to do and I need to do, or will I go in a different direction? And then, so I think when I was 29, I, I went to grad school. So I took some time to just be an artist in the world before. And then I loved the San Francisco Art Institute because I'd been there. I just could see it and it had been a great experience that semester. Wanted to go back and study with Linda Connor, who I'd studied with then. Well, for me, I wanted to, I wanted to go and see something else besides Nebraska, where I grew up. So uh, for me, it was number one, just like getting out to see the world, to see the left coast, and also just to get into a bigger group of people that that like to do the same thing that I like to do, which is make art and talk about art. And so my choices, I only applied to Hunter College in New York and San Francisco Art Institute. And I ended up going to the San Francisco Art Institute because I didn't want to face another winter. <laughs> I was like, I want to, I want to get some sun. I want to see the ocean uh, where I can, where I can get into it, you know? So that was, that was the conscious first choice. But to go to, uh, you know, I in my mind, I I knew that I wanted more time just to make art. And I'd get another couple of years to do that. You know, I was on a roll in undergrad. Like my my productivity was, you know, that's all I did. I was, you know, I I didn't watch television. I listened to music, but uh, I remember my <laughs> I had like a nineteen inch television screen. You know, the old school ones. And it was painted. I painted, did a painting on the face of it. You know, I couldn't even use it just for noise. But yeah, I mean, I, I just, I wanted to get into, keep that groove going. Of course, I knew I had to pay for it somehow. But mainly, you know, I just wanted to keep making art. In the back of my career mind, I thought, yes, I'd, I'd probably teach art after I got done. Like you and I talking now, how, how we talk about all the people that, that we are still in contact with 
from from grad school. I wanted that. I had a, a good group of friends, peers, co-conspirators in undergrad, and I was looking to expand my pool of cohorts in grad school. And and I got a great group. You know, I think it was a, a great time for all the people that I still talk to to be there. Maybe everybody says that about their time, but that's what I wanted. That was the other thing why I wanted to go. I wanted a bigger, a bigger group of crazy artist friends. Not everybody says that, I promise. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. We, we must be uh, blessed in some way. You get what you put into it, I think. Well, it's a little strange, but basically... I apply for a Fulbright, which it's not telling you which school to go to. It's just giving you money to do something. In my case, I was just finishing the six years of undergrad, call it, in Romania. And obviously, I thought, okay, I'll ask for a Fulbright for grad school. No, next step, which at the time didn't even exist. The master's in, it wasn't created yet. It was pretty early on. This was 98 when I applied. I was writing my application in 98. Arrived at SFA in 99, no? So, so the, the master's program didn't even exist in my school at the time. Now it does. Even PhDs, because, you know, you have to. <laughs> so I applied for the Fulbright, and on the application, among a trillion of other things, they ask, what are three schools you would like to go to in America? You know, like... I didn't know anything about anything. I asked a friend who was, you know, a little older than me, a little ahead of me, and who visited U.S. and had some residences at the time, like really early on this stuff, and visited some schools. And he gave me these three names. And I trust him completely, so I knew there are good schools. So, I, so he put SFAI, CCA, and uh, Chicago Art Institute. Okay. All good schools, yeah. All good schools. And I guess because he visited them that he could give me these, name, these names. I mean, I've, I'm not saying that these are the only ones, obviously, but these were the ones I heard at the time, and I put them quickly. I mean, I had to even move fast to the whole application. I had the deadline, all that stuff. So the way it works with Fulbright is they review your application, and if they decide to sponsor you, then they send... They accept, you know, they send your application to the three schools you mentioned. After you first get the money from them, okay? They decide to give the money. So here's the story. <laughs> I'm applying for the Fulbright, which was, I said, I have nothing to lose. I'll, let's do it. In parallel, I'm applying for a government scholarship, like a Romanian government scholarship, national scholarship, for a scholarship in Italy for two years. Both would have started about the same time, like a year difference. One was two years, this one in Italy was two years. The Fulbright was also starting for the next year, but they, they sponsor you one year. So the second year, it's not even certain if you have a master, two year master, you don't know if you finish, you know? Okay, so I'm applying in parallel. And I'm getting the one in Italy. So I'm applying. This is summer of 98. And January 99, I go to Italy to start this thing. Okay. Okay. January 99, I'm starting a scholarship in Venice. While in Venice, I find out I got the full bride <laughs> on the payphone from the street. Basically, I, will, I kept calling the Fulbright Center in Bucharest and go like, did I get it? Did I get it? At some point, she says, yeah, you got it. Uh, you got you, you to gotta accept it to SFAI. You want to go? But this is a conversation on a paid phone, like, you know, that kind of them. <laughs> and I said, yeah, sure. I mean, I was afraid to, to say no because I didn't know how to even deal with this stuff. I wasn't told you got also in the other two. I found out that later. <laughs> well, that's an interesting dilemma. 
so I said I said yes to the first thing because I was afraid I would lose it if I said no. Well, in hindsight, would you have chosen one of the other schools? Yeah, for sh- now in hindsight, knowing better, I would have gone to Chicago for sure. It's a good school. Yeah, I would have probably gone there too. It, at least it maintained being a good school while CFAI kind of stopped in the 70s. Sorry. <laughs> so again, one one is the plan, more or less. I mean, maybe not rigid, but some sort of an idea where you want to be. What what you like to do? I mean, do you why do you do this master? You know, like what do you are you just want to teach? Like you you know you have a plan, you have a mission. I mean, yeah, you need that to teach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. I mean, I am, I'm not saying that it was good being rigid, but you had a plan. To be fair. Um, you know, some people want to the experience of a different school. Some people want more focus on, on one a new direction. I don't know, but but at least have some sort of an idea why you're there, and then you know how to move. The other thing is, if you know how to move, then you know who you care to get close to, in terms of teachers. Like for example, I had. I was in printmaking again, so trying to make installations with bees, live bees, sculpture installation with bees. And I'm presenting this in different critiques. And, you know, the thing that the teachers changed up every semester killed me. You could never build a relationship, no? I had one, one that I could have learned something and I really liked and I really had a good connection. And he went to Yale. This guy was like, he was doing the critiques for two semesters and then he left when he got a job in at Yale, of course. <laughs> and he would have been probably the only teacher that I had something to learn from in my whole master's program. But I'm saying, going back to what I was saying, is knowing that you want, you know, for example, I, I was doing the thing with bees and everybody, every single person, teachers and students said, you should talk to Paul Koss. You should talk to Paul Koss. He will love your work. He will love your work. You, you know. <sighs> I don't want to say bad things about Paul Koss because I really like his work. But And everybody loved him as a teacher too. But he behaved so badly with me because I finally got, you know, like you went, when you have to sign up to a, on a new year, trying to get on his list first first time i'm too, showing up too late he's not taking kids from outside of the new genres so i got i, I got kicked out second time i'm the second on the list nobody even signed up yet i mean like fresh 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 i'm like oh this year i'm making it you know the day of the first day of the, the critique the course i get a note in my mailbox that since you're not a uh, new genre uh, student, you got dropped off. I mean, I'm dropped off. I'm, I'm not on the last one. I'm the second on the list, you know? So I went in. I went in. He had the, all the students in. I, I, went, I went as if I'm going to class, no? And I said, I, I told him, I, I've got this thing. What the hell? I mean, I'm, I've been told to show you your, my work. I'm, you know, I've been encouraged by others. And it's not just that I had my, this idea, uh, I don't care, you're not new genres. Well, I, in three words, you can kick me out. I was so angry, and I'm still angry. <laughs> Probably one of the good, te- the only few good teachers there were at the time, no, at SFAI. You're paying this grad school. It's not free like I've done my six years in Romania. <laughs> I should, you know, I should get this. I should be allowed to, to, to have this last. Done nothing wrong. So this was the parenthesis to say, maybe knowing what you want, you, you get in the right department from the beginning or you move to the right department when you, when you understand that's not right for you. You look for the teachers that might not be in your little section and, and 
try to get to talk to people. I mean, I, I guess this is some has something to do with age too. I mean, I I would be much more relaxed about this suggestion of like go talk to teachers now than I would have been at twenty something. You know, I'm shy. I'm well yes that too but also yeah and you i told you you need to ask questions you know i'm not i'm not not willing to talk i just don't offer <laughs> until you ask so yeah i think a lot of mistakes i made also come from age you know you're not i'm not ready and i wasn't ready for certain things or not knowing how to do them and to give you a, I don't know how useful it is for you, but I had the revelation well, maybe in the last few months, looking back. And since we're talking about this, why the hell? <laughs> I'm going to share it. I had a revelation that I was at the right place at the wrong time. Me. I'm not sure. I'm not like literally a very personal experience i felt like i was at the right place i got to san francisco i got to sfai but it was too early i didn't know how to to navigate i didn't know to navigate the opportunities they were there i just got lost i got lost in 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 too many opportunities from zero because i'm literally coming from zero you should keep that in mind I mean, maybe you would understand more if I tell you a lot of some, you know, stories from not communists, because I managed to get to college after 89, but still pretty fresh after 89 with very little, you know, even materially. Exactly. I agree. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And there was something I wanted to say. Yeah, I would have definitely left. You know, I had the six years after undergrad of undergrad. So I wasn't like immediately out of high school, you know, like four years and done. I had a little more but still switching from two systems and two cultures and two whatevers, very different, a little break would have helped. But I would take a break after high school before college. I think that's a, a more important one. Well, I moved um, to San Francisco to be with Stephen. We were in a long distance relationship for five years. And at one point I just realized that we had to spend like a chunk of time together. He did not want to move to DC because of his work. And so I kind of bit the bullet and I moved to San Francisco. I don't know, I knew I wanted to go to law school. I mean, to not to law school, to art school. Art, actually, it's funny that I say law school because all my family, my mother's side of the family are lawyers. My uncle, my grandfather, my uncles, all his four kids, they're all married to lawyers. I mean, it's kind of obscene. But anyway, so I knew I wanted to go uh, to art school and I heard about SFAI. And as I said before, I walked in there one day. I remember going down that ramp to the lower level. I don't know, something just hit me. I, it was like I fell in love with this place. So I think I did two or three years of studio courses because I felt like I didn't have enough painting experience. I painted, of course, at the Corcoran. And then um, when I went to finish up at AU, I was taking psychology and art both. And so, but I, I just, I felt like I needed more painting experience. So I really did. I worked, I, I went full time for three years doing just studio classes. 
And then I got into the MFA program, which was one of the happiest days of my life. I remember I was just, I was so thrilled. So I was there for about five years. So I, I don't know. I just love that place. I wouldn't have, there are other schools in that area, but I wouldn't have gone to any place else. I remember when I was in Israel, and that's where I did my BA in design in the Academy of Art, the Bezalel Academy of Art. It's a great school for art and for design until today, I think. I applied to the visual uh, communication today, it's called, or graphic design back then. But I remember sneaking into every presentation of the art department that I could in and, and loving that and being kind of critiquing or being not 100% sure about the graphic design department and the, the teachers and the curriculum. And actually, my final project was more an art piece than really a graphic design, if you want. But I still never thought about exploring it more or I'm an artist. I was, if you ask me, I would say I'm a designer. That's what I do for a living. That also was my main interest at that time, you know. So when I moved here, I think being outside of my comfort zone, out of my society, out of my friend group, allows me to explore what else I want to do. And I was also surrounded by those artists who worked, you know, that group. So all that, I think, enabled me to probably um, choose that or test that path, at least. I went, so I took some classes in City College. I took classes in um, Berkeley Extension. That's where I met Anna Novikov, our professor. She became actually my kind of mentor, if you want, that time, because she was very much tapped into the art scene and the art world in San Francisco. So I could ask her all this question. So I did ask her. After taking all these classes, I took one in CCA. Actually, I took some classes that were, when I could, not a evening class. I took some non-credit classes with college students. That was in CCA. I met Mark Thompson, who was my instructor there, which I had really good relationship with him at the time. and. Slowly, I did all these classes and courses and started doing some stuff in my after you know after work, and then started talking. You know, I got more interested and I felt that this is maybe something I want to do. And I talked to Anna Novakov about it, and she was like, "You're on. If you're really serious and you want to do it, the only way to do it is do your masters." I mean, she said. You got to do your master, and obviously she was at the Art Institute. So, but still, you know, being a very, I'm very picky and perfectionist, if you want. I didn't just jump into the Art Institute. I applied to the to the master uh, program in Art Institute, CCA, and I forgot another school. But I think those were the main two at the time that I really liked. And I shadowed some classes. So I went to CCA and sat in classes and just to see how the dynamic was. Also, don't forget that I was a little older than most of the students, even in the master program. I was in my 30s back then. So I had some more experience, I think. And I was interested to read what I was interested to see is the dynamic in the class between the students and the teacher, the instructor mainly the dynamic in between the students. And this is something that maybe, I don't know if you're interested to explore later, but my experience from my first round at school in Israel was that most of the time you learn from your friends. I used to even say, I don't know if it applies, I think it applies to artists. Sometimes you actually learn something despite your teacher, meaning like this teacher sometimes block you. And not knowingly or not intentionally, but I learned most of the time, both in the Bezalel and our, in the Art Institute, from being around the other students. So I was very curious about the dynamic that goes on in the class. That's why I took those shadow classes. And I found out that I love, okay, so, I mean, without, this also 20 years ago, it changed a lot. I know CCA is a different place right now, but in CCA, it was like, Everything was beautiful. They loved everything you do. I love this. I love that. I love this. I love that. In the Art Institute, they were just 
smashing, crashing, and insulting each other. And <laughs> I'm like, yeah, that's not insulting, but being criti- critiquing each other and being direct about it and not sugarcoating it. And that's what I'm used to. Oh, no, to. they were insulting. I don't know what you're <laughs> okay, talking I, about. I mean, <laughs> okay. Even, you know what? I'd rather have that than have everything is beautiful and great. You don't learn from that. This is good for your ego, right? I agree. I remember having a critique. Who was it? D- Doug Doug Hall? It was Doug Hall. And Doug, he, I, I put up my work, and he looked around. He looked at the work. He goes, I love this work. But that's not what we're here to talk about. And then he fucking ripped me a new asshole for like two hours. <laughs> I'm just like, okay, so that's where we are here. So, that's how you learn. Yeah, like, t- well, Tony Labat told me after we graduated that I don't know if this is true, but he told me that all of the faculty, sort of, or at least in new genres, I should be specific. So, like, maybe not every faculty in all disciplines, but in new genres, they all the faculty agreed to like they had this method they called the Phoenix method, which was like all of the first year, no matter what you turned in, it was horrible. They it, they would always tell you it was bad. Everything, no matter how good it was, all first year of your master's program. And then if you got through that, so that, that, uh, that sort of mid mid year or so, you know, that, that transitional review that you had to do in the second year, they would rebuild your confidence and then reconstruct you. And so it was this like destroy you and rebuild you kind of philosophy. Supposedly they actually intentionally did that. Yeah. I mean, it could be, I don't know if it was my experience exactly. Mine was maybe opposite, but I'll tell you in a minute. Or reversed in, in, in chronologically, but I was, this is maybe true for the, for the instructor, the teacher. I was really curious about the students because what I was saying that, you know, in CCA back then, you know, there were a lot of compliments. It was from the student, not necessarily the teacher. The students were very polite and very nice to each other. Very, if you want, American in many ways. And not as I was used to, where people just tell you in your face, you know, what, how shit you are, you know, what your work, you know. And I appreciate that subtlety, you know, I love it until today. I love her here. You get criticism, but you get in a subtle way. I'm, I'm, I like it better than maybe the way I, I got it, let's say in Israel or in the communication there, but I wanted to be more direct and more real. And I felt the students in the art institute were much more in your face, they're much more critical. And and that's that's the reason. So I chose to go with the art institute, you know, I and the new genre department because also I wasn't sure what medium I wanted to do. I also talked to some people and heard that that's the most interesting department back then. It's funny because I remember even I did go through the whole process of, of application. So the one of them was an interview with the head of the department. Back then was Stephen Goldstein in um, CCA, who was actually at the Art Institute before. And when I told him my decision, I already told, knew. So I told him and he was like, you know, I have nothing I can tell you. Uh, I can't convince you. I'm actually from there. He's a great guy. But... Unfortunately, I think the balance changed since then, and I've been following CC. I've been actually teaching them a little bit, and that's a great school right now, I think. I don't know about the Art Institute, but they are doing really good. So, yeah, that's why. And that was despite the fact that, you know, when I went to those shadow classes and I started the application, CCA got this amazing building, the, the new facility in San Francisco. I mean, I was in blown South out, San Francisco, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I went to see, and I saw the, the the studios, and I saw the building, and the support. They had the gallery that was affiliated with some very famous institution. And then you go to the artist studio, and you sit in that studio. What was number the, for the new gen- And like the walls almost looked like they're going to fall on you. And but still, I cared more about that interaction with the students. Let's see, 1995, uh, I got married, I had a baby, and there used to be an Ansel Adams Museum in San Francisco. I don't know if you remember that. 
Uh, I don't think it's there anymore. I don't think so either. No. Yeah, but I had friends in town visiting for the wedding, and it, I took them there, and there was a Nan Golden show there. And I thought, oh, that's color photography. Because I had only known how to do black and white, and I didn't really do much art in undergrad. So it took me about two years, but I decided to learn color printing at well, it was California College of Arts and Crafts then, and I guess it's just California College of Art now. So I signed up to take a color printing class there and work in the dark room, and it was just, like, amazing. And at the time, uh, so Sue Sericlio was my teacher. Larry Sultan was there, Jim Goldberg. So it was just this, like, great environment, five minutes from my house. I mean, I would bring my daughter with me a lot of the times. So. So, yeah, I just started, learned color printing, learned a 4x5 camera, was in critique classes, and after about a year and a half, maybe two years, I was like, okay, what's next? And that was the time when everyone wanted to either go to, like, UCLA or Yale, and I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. So They still do, actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've just blocked that out. Cause like, well, Yale, I will say, well, Yale MFA, for sure. People still want to go there. Right. And that just didn't, you know, I was single parent at that time. And I was like, I don't know. I need to know. And I always loved the Art Institute. When I first moved to San Francisco, I remember just going over to Russian Hill and looking at it. And it's like so magical there. So, yeah, I sort of felt like I run my course at CCAC and it's like, all right, the obvious choice was the Art Institute. So I was pushed along. <laughs> Happily so though, because I think it was totally, you know, the right move. I wasn't going to leave the Bay Area and there was some crossover there with Larry Sultan and Jim and Goldberg and, you know, that I think the support system was in place. So, wait, let me get this straight. Larry Sultan and Jim Goldberg were your literal support system? Well, they were my teachers at CCAC. So, yeah, I think they aided the process for sure. Okay. I'm a little jealous, but okay, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like funny looking back. It's like, wow. Oh. <laughs> I remember going to the library with Larry Sultan. He's like, this is what you need to do. You need to go to the library and look at books of other photographers. And I was like, okay. Oh, boy, I wish I had a mentor that was so helpful. But, you know, those aren't my memories. But some people all did. So good for you. You're lucky. Well, they gave me a hard time, too. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they, they, they pushed me and they questioned me and... Well, as, as a good teacher should. When I graduated from my BFA, there was really kind of a one big place in Israel, big art college in Israel called Betzalel. And that's, you know, if you wanted to be in the best place, that was it. It was like the MIT for art, I guess. And I graduated from Betzalel and really kind of at the very last, last few weeks of my grad program, the head of my department told me about this great place in San Francisco called the San Francisco Art Institute. For me, you know, I, I didn't want to go straight into grad school. I, I wanted to do a couple things before, but it kind of set in the back of my mind. And during my BFA, I was lucky to get an exchange program and spent a semester at SVA in New York. And being kind of an outdoorsy person, New York was not for me. Not at all. I mean, the first couple of days was great. You look up, you see the big buildings, you kind of see the vibe, the art scene, which is unbelievable. But a couple of weeks later, everything seems too big and too much concrete, and you, your face goes down to the ground and sidewalks, and you just want to get to where you want to get, and you don't want to look at anyone, and you don't want to see anything. It was just depressing. So New York was a no-no for me. And San Francisco, having lived in Irvine, California when I was younger, California seemed like a terrific place, outdoorsy. And I heard a lot of good things about San Francisco. And funny enough, I was told Sharon, when Sharon and I started dating, 
I told Sharon, you know, there's a great place. Uh, I know we're, we're, we just started dating, but I do want to tell you that I intend to get my MFA in the West Coast, probably San Francisco. And she said, really? Because I want to go to get my BFA in New York. And I said, well, you know, we'll see what happens. Maybe long distance relationship, maybe not. And her dad had a convention in San Francisco. She went with them and actually got accepted into the BFA program before I got accepted to the MFA program. <laughs> so now I had no choice. <laughs> I had to get into the program. Life does that kind of stuff. It's good. Yeah. So I got into the MFA program and, you know, the rest, at least the, the, the next couple of years from that point, point on, you know, you're familiar with. But yeah, San Francisco to me was ideal. It was just like living in the city, but having the opportunity to, to be outdoors. And I guess the first class that I knew I was taking was a class called Nevada Plus with Jack Bolton. I mean, this was for me the perfect class. It's like getting into a car, going out in the landscape and photographing. And for me, it was perfect. And again, I think the moments that I really enjoyed was the moment the, the 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 actual moment when you're outdoors and you're photographing for me that was the the i guess the big excitement you know translating it to two dimensional image with the frame around it and putting it up on the wall it was okay but the 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 actual moment of being there with your camera it was a big camera taking the time to focus taking the time to actually look at you know kind of observe where you are in 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 getting the feel or, or really kind of sucking in all the, uh, all the landscape. That was for me, the big moment. So I came from a little small town in uh, Canada called Bell River of 3000 people. And I went to the university of Windsor where I did my undergrad. And then uh, I applied for my grad. I did my grad application and I got accepted to a lot of schools, Chicago art Institute, what was that Boston, Boston Museum of Arts or whatever it was called, CCA. And then they all sent me these huge catalogs, right? So they're all like huge, glossy, colored catalogs. And SFA, I remember they sent me an eight half by 11 black and white catalog. And then I just opened that up and went through it. And I'm just like, I'm going there. <laughs> Without even visiting the schools, I just said, I'm going there. That seems like my vibe. And that's how I decided to choose a school. And then uh, the first day I got to San Francisco was the first day I um, saw the school. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I saw the school. I mean, fuck, who, who the hell as a student could have paid to fly out there to look at it and then say, yeah. no, I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't have that luxury. But also, and coming from a small, smaller place, it seemed like and San Francisco was also a small kind of city at the time. Well, still is. is uh, and then I... Uh, I thought that was more of my speed rather than going to somewhere. And I also didn't want to go back to anywhere that had winter. You know, just didn't want to visit winter. And I didn't realize how cold San Francisco was because at night it's bone chilling cold. So I was like, well, I fucked up there. <laughs> so you went further south to Los Angeles. It was a, it's a great, it was a really for me, a great intuitive type of decision. And also my teacher that was at the undergrad, that was my mentor there. She was going to be teaching at SFAI after uh, Sylvie Belanger. She uh, recently passed away a couple, uh, a year ago or something, but uh, rest in peace. And uh, she was really influential in um, not just me taking SFAI also, but also like my development in, uh, in uh, conceptual art and learning all about that stuff. So. I don't know if I could I could necessarily uh, endorse uh, going to grad school. <laughs> well, uh, fancy you say that. That was one of my questions, which is yeah. basically would you, would you and was well I guess okay, so there's sort of some separated questions mm -hmm. that I'm asking everybody. So, was getting an MFA worth it? It was worth it for me because that was my ticket out of the town. You know, and I took that. I don't regret going to grad school. Whether it was worth it, I I think I just partied a lot. And I made, yeah, and I, I got some really great friends out of it. And we still are, are having, doing great things in the art community. And that was nice. But uh, as, in the, as in if you had it, you know, tally it against the money that someone has to pay for it, I'd be like, nope. You know, like, but, you know, you, YouTube didn't exist back then, you know, really. 
And if YouTube exists, if, 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 like if, if school was just like what is now where there's YouTube exists, I learn everything I do on YouTube. You know what I mean? Whether that means an art education, I mean, practically is a tool wise. And that's another thing they didn't really teach you in school, in grad school, was how to do something properly. You know? No, craftsmanship was not their, uh, their sort of no, forte or even, in grad even, school. No, or even using programs. Or, I mean, I remember when we were there, we had uh, those uh, sh- fucking zip drives. And that can only hold 20 megs of information. <laughs> and, they, and they had just introduced Maya as a brand new perso- um, course. Yeah. But, you know, that, and we were in a program called New Genre, just men- mentioned it basically meant anything goes. And it's like, it, that means you could be sloppy as well and, and just trying out ideas, which is great. But uh, as in practicality of, of entering the real world and trying to get a job and, and stuff like that, it's, you know, you, you can't be like, I can, I can, uh, I can uh, roller skate and hold this stuff on my head for 20 minutes. Look at me, you know, <laughs> performance art is like, you know, great in one aspect, but not really practical for uh, the real world. And I'm not saying we have to live in a practical world. I definitely don't in that a lot of ways. I, I haven't worked for a real job in 15 years. And, um, and you know, now I'm doing quite well. It's just, it's just you know, it, it's difficult. It's difficult coming out of that. And especially if you don't already have like a, some kind of trust fund or something to kind of help you out. It's a it's struggle. It's a struggle. So, um yeah, I, I I necessarily right now I, I wouldn't recommend unless you you know have have the means to do it and the education is good if you want to be specialized in a certain certain idea of of your practice. But uh, I think a lot of it, as in just technically, can be learned from from YouTube, especially anything like that. And yeah, but I mean, grad school is a lot, as you said, is it's about uh, getting to know the people and the connections you make, you know? Yeah, and that's one of the mistakes I made. Having 20 years of hindsight, would you go back and do it again? Well, I would have done a lot of things differently, perhaps leading up to that, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah, I'm probably focusing too much on grad school as like a pivotal time in our yeah. careers. Kind I of mean, I, I think graduate school is really important. For It was important for me, I think. And I am currently in graduate school again for my master's in teaching. But it's, you know, it's I'm doing it much more methodically. I am, you know, I've taken a break and really thinking about the outcomes and whether it's financially, you know, even necessary or what does this mean for me? Can I just read these things on my own and get the same thing out of this experience? And so I'm not like full entrenched in it also because I'm raising a family and I have a full-time job. And, you know, so I am much more thoughtful about the steps this second time around. And I don't want to go into debt. I want to pay for it as I go. And all those things. If I had had a different college experience, I might have chosen something else the first time round. If I had had a more realistic sense of, you know, this is a total pipe dream, what you want, and the chances are very slim, I might have reconsidered the financial investment. It's fair because San Francisco was not cheap, but be it the cost of living and also then, of course, the cost of tuition and then the art supplies and all that. I mean, it, it was definitely by far not the cheapest option. You know, I mean, I probably could have gone to a dozen other schools that would be substantially cheaper. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I would say an MFA is useful only if you want to teach. If you re- I mean, if you want to teach, because I know a very successful woman who went to language school and then she learned to paint because she liked to paint with, with a painter in Italy. And now she's like, she's showing and she's working and she's good. And she never had a one day of art school. And she doesn't look you know, amateur at all. 
she's active, she shows in galleries, she sells, she lives from her work. Not only, husbands do, but so our school, not useful. If you think you need to be an artist, you're going to be an artist without the art school. To wrap this up, I'd like to thank you for listening all the way to the end of the conversation. We would appreciate it if you would share the podcast with your friends, family, co-workers, studio mates, or anybody with an interest in arts and creative endeavors. The building and strengthening of the arts and creative community is at the core of our mission for this podcast. They can listen and subscribe on Spotify, Apple Podcast, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. The audio was edited by Cush Audio Services, and the music was created by Pete Bybee. The Wise Fool Art Podcast is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene in Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes or on our website, wisefoolpod.com.